This is an opium field in the UK, and this is an opium field in Afghanistan. Opium is farmed and cultivated across the globe, in the Middle East and Central Asia, the UK, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, and some regions in Latin America. However, the production can contrast from this to this. While the illicit production of opium is seen across the globe, producing the now necessary opiates like morphine. Lurking in the shadows and fueling some of the greatest instability in regions is the illicit production of opium in the likes of Afghanistan and Mexico for heroin. While the plant remains constant, the laws do not. The dichotomy of these two global economies is ever present in a world featuring America's opioid crisis and the wars in the likes of Afghanistan, and the juxtaposition in terms of production and consumption in the illicit and illicit taxonomies is ever growing in its vastness. One riddled with crime, corruption, violence, murder, and overdoses. The other, a safer, regulated, and legitimate alternative. Both of these markets behold billions of dollars, all centered around one plant. However, the difference is immeasurable. I suppose we should begin with looking at production, and that takes us to one of the most violent and damaged areas in the world today, Afghanistan, the home of 85% of the world's illicit heroin production. After decades of conflict, the country still finds itself engulfed in turmoil. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. After the US invasion in 2001, they have since fought their longest war in history, yet the Taliban still remains as powerful as ever. Despite the US deploying over 100,000 soldiers at one point and spending over $1 trillion, the importance of the empowerment and insurgency and the longevity of the Taliban's success in Afghanistan must be analysed and discussed with the opium trade. While the opium poppy has been grown in Afghanistan for hundreds of years, it grew from the ashes of conflict, offering farmers some form of stable revenue in a country far from stability itself. Opium cultivation has been growing in Afghanistan steadily since the Soviet occupation in the 1970s, until the Taliban banned it in 2000, seeing a 94% drop in that year's harvest. The ban was a disaster, as Afghanistan's agricultural industry, especially in the region of Helmands, had essentially become a monocrop, and with a loss of profits from opium on an already weak society, it collapsed, allowing the US to easily crush the Taliban with their invasion in 2001. However, the Taliban's revival four years later was made possible by the US planting the siege which allowed them to grow back to prominence. Once the ban was gone, opium production in Afghanistan surged once again. The farmers in Afghanistan are rational. At one point, opium offered 17 times more profit than growing wheat, and with rising food prices, this was key to farmers. Opium is drought resistant, easy to store and transport, and is well suited to Afghanistan's climate. Opium was the perfect plant to grow in the rubble of a broken country. By 2003, in an unprecedented manner, opium had grown to be responsible for 62% of Afghanistan's total GDP. There was systematic corruption across local leaders and the police force, as Afghanistan descended into the first narco state. The US offloaded onto the UK forces the efforts to crack down on the opium production, sticking to the traditional Iron Fist rule enforcement of the war on drugs. However, their efforts were unsuccessful. The insurgency of the Taliban was growing and growing at this point, and in 2007, the UN reported they had started to extract from the drug economy resources for arms, logistics, and militia pay, which was now responsible for 93% of the world's total illicit opium. The Taliban had begun to demand taxes across all of the profitable supply line from cultivation to trafficking, and was making huge amounts doing so. The US's inability to deal with the meteoric rise of the illicit opium industry in Afghanistan was now funding and empowering their enemies, and has done so ever since. In an attempt to disempower the insurgency and revitalization of the Taliban, the US deployed huge amounts of troops, adding an additional 40,000 combat troops bringing the total to 70,000. Aware of the importance of the opium trade in the Taliban's rise, they began an attempt to target and suppress the cultivation through crop destruction, distributing information and wheat seeds and fertilizer to encourage farmers to move away from opium cultivation. And in fact, there was a fall in opium production in Afghanistan up until 2010 from 2007. 
although there were other factors involved, such as rising wheat prices, which made the product more profitable to grow and allow farmers more food security. However, the remaining opium production was still significant and was sufficient to fund the Taliban. Under the Obama era, a surge of new troops were deployed, bringing the total number to 102,000 at one point. The new troops would land in the Taliban-held provinces, like opium cultivation capital Helmand, to fight the guerrilla Taliban soldiers. However, as the US failed to deal with the opium production and mainly attack the enemy soldiers, they were left fighting a new batch of trained and armed soldiers from Afghan villages who were involved in the opium trade every year, and opium production levels began to rise again. As we delve further into the new decade, it seemed the Taliban were becoming more and more intrinsically connected with the opium trade, which had surpassed the all-time high level of 2007, with many saying the Taliban had essentially become a cartel. As the New York Times stated, it had become difficult to distinguish the group from a dedicated drug cartel. No longer did they simply collect tax from the opium industry, they were the biggest guarantee of trafficking raw opium and heroin out of Afghanistan. After sadly losing so many soldiers, the US seemed to have abandoned its on-the-ground attempts to cull opium trade, and in 2017, Trump initiated Operation Iron Tempest. This air campaign was an attempt to destroy the thriving drug industry, with US officials estimating there to be 500 drug labs. Since then, the US have launched 200 aerial strikes in an attempt to decimate the Taliban's narcotic operations. Yet, illicit opium production in Afghanistan still thrives, as opium production still grows to record levels despite the US's attempts. Research by David Mansfield discovered the US's targeting of these drug labs not only failed to stop any real opium cultivation, but also had little impact on the Taliban's finances. Not only were some of the labs targeted in the airstrikes inactive, those that were active rarely had any significant storages of heroin, so the US was essentially hitting empty mud huts, which Mansfield estimated to be worth $10,000 to $20,000, bearing in mind the $140 million F-22 being used to bomb the drug sites cost at least $35,000 an hour to fly. The war in Afghanistan is seen by some as a major failure. Over a trillion dollars later, they now find themselves entering peace talks with the Taliban, who they had temporarily crushed 19 years ago. The global prohibition of drugs started and promoted by the US creates the demand which allows the illicit opium industry to thrive in countries like Afghanistan, and many would believe it's this industry which has been one of the keys to the Taliban's resurgence and the US's failure in Afghanistan. However, the war on drugs and the illicit demand it creates is rarely mentioned in the discussion of Afghanistan. In Australia, half the world's opium is grown for medicinal opioids, as farmers were given licenses to grow the plant which the US spends billions on bombing in Afghanistan. The regulated and safe farms are now spreading across different regions in Australia, as they offer farmers an easy and demanded crop which can return good profits. Similarly, in the UK in the 21st century, farmers began growing opium poppies. So as our soldiers fought to destroy the poppy in Afghanistan in the early 21st century, back home our farmers were growing the exact same thing. While these countries' internal politics couldn't be more different to Afghanistan, this offers an insight to the other side of opium production, stripped free from prohibition, which creates and empowers the corruption, violence and crime we see engulfing Afghanistan. The cultivation of opium is not only constant throughout history, but is also necessary at current. However, once again the outdated laws we see within the war on drugs creates the violence and utter destruction of lives for those who fall victim to these laws. This is a contradiction at the heart of the war on drugs, as while one country may collect revenue and tax and uphold farming jobs, another is bombed and fights internally due to growing the exact same plant. One country that has become a victim of the illicit trade is Turkey. 
However, as opposed to turning to the traditional war on drugs methods of eradication and fumigation of the plants, they decided to embrace it. While Turkey was classified as a traditional opium producing country, along with India, after a new UN crackdown on global opium production in 1967, a substantial amount of illicit produced opium was being diverted into America's illicit heroin market. And after Nixon's announcement on a rejuvenated war on drugs, the US began to apply pressure on Turkey to ban the production of opium and threatened to cut off their foreign aid. So in 1972, they obliged, banning the cultivation of opium. However, this only lasted two years, and in 1974, Turkey introduced a new state controlled license system, which allowed the farmers to gain a license to grow opium for medical purposes. Unlike the UK and Australia's highly industrialised industries, Turkey's licit opium production remained in the hands of a huge number of farmers. It was estimated in 2005, decades after the transition to a licit regulated system, the opium industry in Turkey holds 5,000 jobs and creates $60 million worth of export income a year. However, while this may have been beneficial to Turkey, it had little to no effect on the global illicit heroin industry, due to something called the balloon effect. Squeezing the balloon, a metaphor for drug control methods, simply moves the air to another location inside the balloon. Similarly, drug control methods relocate the drug production elsewhere, as the drug control methods do not deal with the problem, the initial demand for the drugs. The Turkish market was able to gain legitimacy, but the issue at the heart of the global drug problem, the demand for drugs such as heroin, saw no change. In the back streets of the US, the demand for heroin was still rife. The needle must be filled. And funnily enough, a lot of this demand was met by the previously mentioned producers in the likes of Afghanistan and Mexico. The global heroin trade transcends domestic politics and is empowered by the global prohibition of drugs and its inability to deal with and help the users who create the demand. Obviously, this sort of reform cannot be suggested seriously in Afghanistan, as it lacks the infrastructure and legitimacy of government to reform the economy in such a drastic manner and any conversation of a global shift from the illicit drug market and the end of the war on drugs to illicit, safer and regulated market can only be discussed as merely a fantasy at current. However, when I was researching Afghanistan's and more importantly a Taliban's connection to the opium industry, I kept thinking of a quote Pablo Escobar's son told journalist Johan Harry, the only thing my father truly feared was the legalisation of drugs. The current crisis started in the 1990s, with the overprescription of opioid painkillers like Oxycontin. Over the next decade, a growing number of people became dependent on these drugs. And for many, what started with pills grew into a heroin addiction. Then in 2014, potent synthetic opioids like fentanyl began entering the drug supply in large amounts. Once Americans were kicked off their pills and forced into the underground markets of heroin and the newly synthetic opioids like fentanyl, they lost all hope. The prohibition of drugs, while meant to protect users from dangerous drugs, does the exact opposite. Those addicted were now forced into an unregulated market in which their heroin could be a hundred times stronger than they anticipated. There are no way of getting clean needles, finding safe spaces to consume, and no way to deal with the underlying and omnipresent problems which push them towards addiction in the first place, which is usually a result of social circumstances, a mental health issue, or childhood trauma, as opposed to simply the chemical addiction to a drug, as explained here by Johan Harry. Where is the opioid crisis happening, right? I've been to a lot of the epicenters of it, places like Monadnock in, in New Hampshire. Why, is, why are things so disastrous there? Why is there much higher uh, opioid um, addiction in West Virginia than on the faculty of Harvard, right? People on the faculty of Harvard have much better access to opioids, right? Everyone there has good health insurance. They have much better access. What's going on? The, the, some amazing economists, Sir Angus Dayton and Anne Case, did a massive study of this. And they said that we need to understand the opioid deaths mainly as what they call deaths of despair, right? It's not a coincidence that the places where opioid addiction is highest are also the places where suicide not with opioids is highest, where antidepressant prescriptions are highest. It's a whole... These things are clustering together for a reason, right? And you don't have to spend much time in those places to see people through no fault of their own have, are like the rats in that first cage, right? They have been deprived of the things that make life meaningful. This doesn't mean chemical hooks don't play some role. They do play a role. But I've been to the places that have solved this, and it wasn't by thinking primarily about that. So I'll just talk about the reality of chemical hooks, if that's right, because I think it's very important to understand in relation to 
opioids. So there's a very strong agreement among scientists that the most powerful chemical hook we know is nicotine, right? You smoke cigarettes, like my mother smokes 70 cigarettes a day. You smoke cigarettes. The thing you feel a physical craving for when you stop, which my mother would never do, is, um, is nicotine, right? That's the chemical hook. Um, and so in the late 80s, when nicotine patches were invented, there's this huge wave of optimism among scientists because they're like, oh, right, cigarette smoking is an addiction to the chemical hook, nicotine. Now we can give people all the chemical hook they're addicted to without any of this shitty cancer-causing smoke. People are going to stop smoking, right? Um, so nicotine patches are introduced and the US Surgeon General's report a couple of years later finds highly motivated people um, using nicotine patches, 17% um, of them will stop smoking, right? Now, it's important to say that is not nothing, right? That means if you meet the chemical hook for people who are addicted to cigarettes, 17% of them will stop entirely. That's a big deal, right? That saved a huge number of people's lives. But obviously, 17% is not 100%. That leaves 83%. They've got to be explained by the other things. And that's really the factors that I talk about in, in Lost Connections. So, I mean, there's a whole range of them. But, you know, if you are acutely lonely, we are the loneliest society there's ever been, Right you are much more likely to be vulnerable to despair, depression, addiction. If you are controlled and humiliated at work, which most people now are to some degree, you're much more vulnerable to these things. There's a whole range, I go through nine of these, these factors in the book, but if your doctor in this country finds out that you are using, say, Percocet or Oxy, not because you've got back pain, but because you've got an addiction, your doctor, by law, has to cut you off, right? If they don't, they can be busted as a dealer. It's happened to lots of doctors. Um, so they have to cut you off. So instead of giving you the drug, we stop you getting the drug. Most people then, or not most, a very large number, then transfer to much more dangerous street drugs like heroin. Secondly, far from giving you help to turn your life around, we give you a criminal record, we shame you, we stigmatize you, we put barriers between you and reconnecting. The opposite of addiction is connection, but what do we do? We put barriers between people and reconnecting. As he writes in Chasing the Screen, the places with the biggest opioid crisis are also the places with the highest suicide rate and the highest anti-depression issues. What Johan Harry is discussing is the biggest issue at the crux of the war on drugs. War on drugs sees addiction as a crime, but it must be seen as a mental health issue. A drug addict's fundamental desire to escape reality, seen clearly with heroin addiction, will not be treated by an increased sentence for possession or locking them in a cell. The criminalisation of addicts has done nothing to solve a drug problem, as we now have a century's worth of evidence to support that in America. So, how do you solve the problem of an opioid crisis? Well, luckily, there's a perfect example, Switzerland. This is Switzerland in the 1980s. It's a mess. Thousands of addicts would gather here every day to shoot up. It was a period of horror for the public, as hard drug use, usually pushed to the shadows of society, was in the spotlight, an unavoidable problem which had to be addressed. There was an estimated 20,000 users in Zurich alone in 1988. Needles were shared leading to a subsequent rise in HIV, overdoses occurred on the streets, and the crime rates increased. Parks became full of users injecting in public, and the public watched on in horror as their orderly society began to descend into chaos. Now usually a country would follow America's playbook, enforce stricter rules, employ more police and try to crack down harder on the drug, ruling by the iron fist. However, it was pretty clear this wouldn't work, so Switzerland did the opposite, and in 1992 Switzerland implemented heroin assisted therapy. The new policy focused on four pillars, treatment, allowing those addicted to receive help, harm reduction, reducing the possibilities of an overdose or HIV from a shared needle, prevention, helping those affected with their addiction and working with them to get through it. And finally, law enforcement, removing the black market for heroin and criminal activity that follows it as it was no longer required by users. The fundamental idea behind the policy being to treat addicts as humans and victims of their addiction as opposed to criminals. The policy allowed for the opening of safe spaces or heroin clinics in which users could go to daily to collect free, clean and tested heroin, along with clean needles in a clinic in which they could be monitored and looked after. They were also subsequently given support and guidance to turn their lives around and get jobs and housing. These clinics were first opened in 1994 on a three year trial period and the effects were phenomenal. This chart shows a consistent fall in drug related deaths in Switzerland after 1994 through the usage of non-illicit substances in a cleaner, safer environment. Furthermore, new users of the drug, a fear among many with drug legalization, fell by 80% from 1991 to 2010 
It says about for a more orderly society in which addicts have the chance to redeem themselves and thrive within, subsequently removing the need for heroin as they find a different meaning in life. One concern with the initiative could be an excessive cost for funding the usage of heroin. However, despite an initial cost, they save between 12,700 and 20,400 euros per patient per year, as the fall in crime and subsequent decreasing of those held in prison, along with police time and resources, led to a positive economic outcome for the Swiss. The programme is obviously a massive success in reducing the risks for an amount of users in Switzerland, so it subsequently gained public support, as a 2008 referendum saw 68% of the public support making the programme permanent, despite the usual conservative consensus in Switzerland. An expert in Switzerland said this about the programme. Switzerland is not so modern, but it is very pragmatic, and Swiss politics is very pragmatic. Even without a more investment and care for those addicted, the legalisation offers a monetary and overall gain for society, concluding anyone with an ability to act pragmatically could see. Switzerland now imports and supports illicit heroin producers like the UK, which sees an actual shift away from the illicit heroin trade, as users no longer rely on the black markets to support their addiction, collapsing the illicit heroin trade in Switzerland. The dichotomy between the illicit and licit opium industries couldn't be clearer. In terms of production, the illicit market is engulfed in crime, fuels domestic conflicts and empowers criminals across the globe. While the illicit market creates jobs and supports local farmers, offers high amounts in taxes to the government and most importantly is safe and regulated. Again in terms of consumption, the illicit market is empowering criminals and is fundamentally dangerous for users, achieving an environment completely opposite to a drug law's purpose. Of illicit consumption is safer and regulated and offers users a future without the drug. The conversation on drug laws is shifting across the globe, especially in terms of cannabis. However, it is clear now further discussions must be held on the prohibition of heroin and the benefits of it remaining in a criminalised, unregulated market.